Okay, um, so the, my topic uh, is pretty much about the curriculum. And uh, let me just say off the bat that um, you probably wonder, how do we get to this point? You've heard, you know, good news, but you've heard a lot of bad news, too, all day. And uh, I just want to suggest that um, one of the causes for um, the state we're in right now is possibly decade after decade after decade of compromises in the curriculums of our public schools. That's the only explanation I could think of to explain how we have so many people going out and voting for some of the candidates we have, some of the elected officials we have. Um, so I'm going to try to argue that this is part of the root cause of the whole problem. Okay, so my presentation is called uh, Book Burning 101, and uh, this is about the a citizen's request for reconsideration of a work. Uh, I'm being facetious when I call it book burning, and I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, so again, this is like a hands-on thing. The question is, what exactly is Policy 109? And I believe every school district has a Policy 109. Uh, why would you ever use Policy 109? How would you go to? How do you use Policy 109? And then we'll get back to this question about book burning. Uh, then we'll, then I'll, I'll try to go through this pretty quick, and then we can have you know, hopefully more comments and questions at the end. Okay, so what is Policy 109? Policy 109 is the public school policy for selecting and removing resource materials used in the curriculum. And of course, resource materials are books, but it's also library books, films, uh, software, and any other instructional material. Policy, rec policy 109 recognizes that school administrators are human, and therefore they make mistakes when they review and approve material for the curriculum. Believe it or not, not every single resource material in the curriculum is perfect, okay? There are mistakes. So Policy 109 recognizes that uh, the community has both the right and the obligation to notify the school district when errors are discovered. This is really all part of kind of a social contract. You know, with public schools, we basically agree to hand them our money or allow them to take our money, okay? But, so we're giving up some of our liberty, but in exchange for the social contract, the deal is they have to follow some rules, okay? And those rules, again, apply to how the curriculum is, is, is structured. Here's an excerpt uh, from Policy 109. This is from the Easton School District. Uh, so when they select materials, they're supposed to place principle above personal opinion and reason above prejudice in the selection of materials of the highest quality. It doesn't say the lowest quality. It says the highest quality. This is to assure that there's an appropriate comprehensive collection. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, weeding. Weeding is the uh, term that the Easton School District uses uh, to refer to the process of removing books. They don't say that they're removing the book. They don't say they're burning the book. They don't say that they're banning the book. They, they call it weeding. So, and they have some text here. It says, in general, materials shall be considered for discard for any of the following reasons. This is just a few of the reasons. Uh, it might be out of date. The content might be obsolete, inaccurate, or misleading. There's a line in there about, uh, you know, a book might contribute to false concepts regarding minority or ethnic groups. So these are some of the reasons that they use for uh, weeding or removing a book. Okay, now why would you want to use Policy 109? Um, again, it's called reconsideration. Uh, why ask for reconsideration? Well, ultimately, we want to improve the quality of our public school curriculum. That's what it's about. More importantly, we want to make sure that the curriculum is aligned with the values of the community. Okay? And as I say down here in the bottom, public schools exist for the benefit of the community, not the other way around. All right, so what are some attributes of a so-called defective curriculum? Well, a defective curriculum may contain resource materials that promote political agendas. This is the idea that you're going to take public dollars and use them to promote specific political agendas in the classroom. That would be a defect. Other examples would be, would be economic, scientific, or historical fallacies. Um, above all, education should be truthful. You know, we don't teach that one plus one equals three. We don't teach that the earth is flat. Uh, fallacies are our concern. Uh, another one is pretty rare, but I'm going to give you an example of this. We should promote illegal drug use or other criminal behavior in the curriculum especially now that we call our public schools, uh, they're classified as drug-free zones. So you would think that would be a, an obvious one. And then finally, uh, here's the idea of vulgar belittlement of targeted groups of the community. Um, you know, there's, certain, there's nothing wrong with criticizing 
certain groups of the community, you know, scholarly criticism. But I think it draw. I think we go across the line when we when we're vulgar and belittling about it. Again, what is the purpose of that in a, in a public school curriculum? I have examples of that. Uh, other ex, other examples of defective curriculum may you know as you might expect material that has excessive profanity. Uh, some profanity is now allowed, by the way. So I'm talking about <laughs> excessive profanity. This is the you know this is 2012 now. Uh, graphic violence or uh, explicit sexual content. Finally, a defective curriculum should also include materials that lack educational value. Okay, this is an important point. Think about it. The amount of time that uh, students spend in school is very limited. Okay, so the curriculum, for that reason, has to be very selective. Only the materials of the highest quality deserve a seat at the table. So even so, even though a book might might not be offensive or might not you know, might not fit any of those other criteria. If it's just a bad book with very little educational value, that alone should be a reason to remove it from the curriculum. Again, we should only have, we should only have the highest uh, quality materials. All right, so I'm going to go through some examples here pretty quick. Uh, these examples all, these are all examples of approved materials from local schools, okay? And that means um, the, the, state, the superintendent of these schools actually signed off on this. I should note that Everything in the curriculum is signed off by the superintendent. Every single resource is signed off. Here we go. Well, you may or may not know that uh, Al Gore's film is still shown in science class. Uh, somehow it was passed off as science. That's probably common knowledge. Uh, and this is another popular movie that they show in school. They show this. To, 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 this, this movie is often shown to uh, highlight the benefits of health care in Cuba. This is a good movie they show. This is, a, this is an R-rated film version of Macbeth. Now, there happens to be, I think, 10 or 11 movie versions of Macbeth. I have no, there's nothing wrong with Macbeth. Uh, a lot of schools actually pick the one that's the most graphic, has the most sexual content, the most violent. They pick the Roman Polanski R-rated version of Macbeth that was produced by Playboy. Um, and this is uh, a lot of graphic violence uh, in movies. Let me just ask real quick, are, are you aware that they show Hollywood movies in school nowadays? Who, who's aware of that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So here's, let me just show you a quick example, just so you get a feel for it. You probably can't hear the sound, but you'll get the idea. This is a movie they show in the Council Rock School District. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the educational value is, um, but um, you, you'll get the idea here. You'll get the idea. Yeah, this is not only shown, but it's approved by the uh, superintendent. You can go on the website, this is in Council Rock, you can go on the website and actually see the uh, paperwork that they, that they put on the website. Is this a fantasy, um, is this a character in the movie fantasy? Yeah, this is a dream sequence. Okay. Yeah. So it's okay then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the profanities that you probably can't hear. And of course, I'm taking this out of context, right? So, you know, if you watch the whole movie, it's not nearly as bad. So. Uh, I have, I have, I have about 20 more examples uh, on, on here, uh, very similar to this. I won't, you know, for the sake of time, I'm only going to show you this one. Okay, so that's. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, why do they show Hollywood movies, right? No, I just oh. meant, what would be the reasoning for showing that in the shooting part, what it relates to? Um, I think the answer is, the best theory I've heard is, this is the theory, um, if we don't show graphic movies like that, we can't reach the children, okay? We can't, not, we can't keep them engaged. So we have to, if we don't keep them entertained, if we don't engage them, 
they will just tune out and they'll learn nothing then. So it's better to entertain them uh, than to have them learn nothing. That's the best theory I've heard so far that makes the most sense to me. If you have some other ideas, please share them at the end. <laughs> okay, um, now this last one is more of a local uh, of interest. This is a book called uh, Nickel and Dimed. And um, this is a book that's just shocking to me um, because, here it is. Um, because here's a book that's used in many schools throughout the country. Here in the Lehigh Valley, it's used in Easton, Nazareth, and Southern Lehigh. Um, what's, re what's remarkable about this book to me is that the author is actually a political activist, a self-described professional political activist. She's the founding co-chair of the Democratic Socialist of America Party, and she's currently an active leader in the Occupy Wall Street movement. That's her profession. She wrote a book called Nickel and Dime, and she, I believe, intentionally marketed it to our high schools and colleges for the purpose of pushing her political agenda in the classroom and in your tax dollars. And in this group, I, I doubt that many people would agree with her political agenda, but that's really not the point. The point is that she's pushing any political agenda, you know, with public dollars. All right? Uh, that's the tone of the book. At the end, as I'm reading this book, I can't believe it. Then I get to the end, and she comes right out and says it. Uh, in the book, it says, what, uh, readers often ask me, what, what can I do to help? Okay, because keep in mind, this book is nonfiction. It's written in the first person by the author. And she answers that, well, you can do many things. You can join a national organization like ACORN. Okay? And then she goes on to say four or five other organizations you can do, and all the different ways that you can become politically active. Okay, to help push the agenda that she just described in her book. Okay, so in my mind, this is unbelievable. It's really crossing the line between a book about some political ideology, and now we're going to the point of political activism. Yes, Paul? Okay. Living wage legislation really refers to it's a Marxist movement all across the country. Yes. Uh, so that's actually advocacy for Marxism. Directly. Yeah. And again, this time it happens to be advocacy for Marxism. But my objection to the book is that there's advocacy for anything in the public school classroom with public dollars. Um, yeah, and here's an example where here's the Occupy Wall Street movement, and she was quoted recently as saying, I'm very excited. As far as I can see, this is what I've been waiting for. So her 10-year her project to uh, indoctrinate kids in the classroom is finally paying off for her in the form of the Occupy Wall Street movement. So, uh, okay, so that's, that was the main objection to it. But as I kept reading the book, I found, that that, I found out that there were other objections to it uh, that I also believe are um, universal and disinterested. For example, um, there's a very cavalier tone about drugs in the book. Here's, a, here's an example. She says, uh, the truth is I don't much care if my fellow workers are getting high in the parking lot or even lifting an occasional retail item. And I certainly wouldn't snitch if I did. Right? Very good message for, for kids. All right? Um, and then I kept reading and I found out that there's two entire pages on detailed instructions on how to beat a pre-employment drug test. And you're just, a, just to get an idea. You drink water at all times, blah, blah, blah. This went on for two pages. And what's funny is, here's a sign. This is what you see when you enter the uh, administration building in, in Easton when you go to speak to the school board. You find out that, that the drug-free <laughs> school zone. And yet, here's a book that was signed off by the superintendent which tells you how to beat a pre-employment drug test. Um, so let's get to the quality of the book. This book is used in advanced placement English. And I, you know, I'm, I, mean, I won't even read this. You can read it for yourself. You get the idea. This is, trust me, I'm not, take, I'm not picking out the only two sentences from the book, OK? There are dozens of examples like this that give you an idea of the quality of the book. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an eighth grade reading level. It's, it's, it's banal, it's trite, it's trash, um, and this is, this is a sense of what it's like. It, it, it begs the question, why would, it, why would a school district use a book that is so, you know, low quality, unless it had a political agenda that, that they all agree with? Okay, that's, that's the only thing I can come up with in my mind to explain why they would use a book like this, despite these other problems. Uh, what answer do you think you would get if you asked them why they allow it? I'll get to that in a minute, because uh, I have asked them that. <laughs> and there's a, little bit of, there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel at the end. Uh, there's three more reasons. Here's our ranking in reading. We're 17th in reading. We're 23rd in science. And we're 31st in math. We're just barely above the so-called pigs of Europe. Okay? 
And it begs the question, do you think that the top countries are like uh, China, Korea, Singapore, Norway, I believe, or Finland? And you really have to wonder, do, do you think they spend time reading books like Nickel and Dime? And I would, I'm, going, I'm going out on a limb, but I'm thinking that they probably don't. All right, so I'm talking about Nickel and Dime, but this applies to really any resource material in any school district. So if you come across something that you find is objectionable or substandard, how would you go about um, addressing it? Okay, well, this is how to use Policy 109. As you can see, it's a very simple, simple process. Okay, uh, it starts. Is there? Yeah. It starts up here where you identify the defect, and then you notify the principal. Okay. Now, at that point, the principal can either say, "Yes, Mr. Adams, you're right. This book is horrible. I'm going to remove it," or he's going to say, "No, we think this book is great," and he'll then ask you to submit a formal request. And that's what happened to me two years ago. They said, uh, "Mr. Adams, we have a form. It's called the Citizen's Request for Reconsideration of a Work." He actually said, you know, we've never used this form before in the history of the school, but we have it, and if you wouldn't mind, would you please fill it out and send it in? He was very nice to me at that point. Okay? So, so I filled out the form, and I was shocked, because I found that what happened next was he formed a committee. They actually assembled a committee of seven teachers and four administrators to all read the book, then get together and have a meeting and talk about the book, okay, presumably on the public time. And then they decided whether my request had any merit or not. And what happened next was, believe it or not, they unanimously decided that there was nothing wrong with the book. Okay? This book was wonderful. It was a unanimous decision, by the way. Now, I was a little surprised by that, because everyone I knew, all my friends, my coworkers, you know, they all thought this book was horrible. So how is it that the, the community opinion was not being reflected by this board, okay? this unanimous board? So the board said it's great, unanimous. They recommended to the superintendent to reject my request. That's what happened. But policy 109 allows you, don't, don't, don't stop there. Policy 109 says that the school board can overrule the super deci superintendent's decision. Okay? Some people don't realize that the superintendent reports to the school board, not the other way around. And a lot of people don't realize the school board if you get nothing else out of this, remember, the school board is responsible for the curriculum, not the superintendent, not the teachers, not the principals. The school board is. People who are on the school board don't even know that, okay? Is that fair to say? That's, that's <laughs> no. The policy is very clear that the process of selecting resource materials is delegated to the superintendent, okay? So that doesn't mean as a school board member, you got to look at 100 resource materials every year. That's delegated to the superintendent. But you, as a board member, are responsible for the content of the curriculum. I, when yes, I brought up the, the issue I had on a globalization and diversity book, um, there, were, there was a school board member, she's been on the board 15 years, it's the first time that it's ever been discussed. Right. And that, I told to you. Not to approve them. I was a first member to even read or really look at a book and just right. recommend not approving it. That's because... By law, I went down in flames, but, right, right. you know, but at least, you know... Have you won anything yet, Brian? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. My dad got a book removed when I was in high school some years back. That, that was, was the last time it happened. Yeah. <laughs> the other, that's the other example. <laughs> before the school board, and it broke in the front page of the bulletin in the inquiry. Yeah. It was removed quite quickly after that. Um, what, 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 old German or... That was that old lamp, you know, he was reading it by lamp. You know, was that book in old, written in old German? <laughs> hey, let me ask you a quick question. Did that actually go to a school board vote, or was it removed at the superintendent's level? I, I don't remember. I removed it, but I know it broke in the front page of the okay. paper, and after that, there's no longer mandatory reading. In the right. So it, it can happen. It's very rare. It's like Haley's Comet, but, it's very, but it can happen. All right, so what happens? So, so then you go to the board, right? So what I did is I, I wrote to the board, I said, you know, I think, I think that this committee was, you know, they said unanimous and everybody I know thinks this book is bad, so there, there's a disconnection here. As, as a school board member, you're representing the community, would you please weigh in on this and decide whether this book should be removed or not? And they just ignored me, okay, for two years, okay? They ignored me, they ignored other people in the community. Now, for two years, what was happening was people were writing letters to the editor, People were being interviewed on Gunther. People were being uh, interviewed on other radio shows, right? Morning Call. Hundreds and hundreds of comments back and forth, you know, pro and con. Okay, so obviously this was a, a, a sore issue in, in the community, okay? 
So after two years of, of all this publicity, uh, finally we got a new board, six new members. Okay, so there was there were in, in Easton six of the nine members didn't make it. <laughs> okay, now that's not because of this book. That's because of a laundry list of problems in Easton that you're probably familiar with. So we had six new board members. So I renewed my request with them, and uh, they again tried to ignore it, um, but but pressure was leveraged. And I, what I can report to you as of literally this this past week. Uh, in a stunning development, um, we had a meeting, uh, an academic committee meeting, and believe it or not, the Easton Board is now going to vote to keep or remove nickel and dime at their next meeting on May 22nd. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, a roll call vote. Every board member will have to be go on the record as, as being for or against nickel and dime. And to, to the, to the, yeah, and a lot of it is uh, credited to Ronnie Delbacco. Uh, He's, he's really ramped up a lot of pressure. What, so that's a, that's a stunning development. Can, can I say that what was the real effective thing was, and it's actually on the web, the web the, I don't know where, but they literally sat down and they each had two minutes and they got five like minutes. eight, five minutes, and yeah. how many people did you have speak? I think you had like five so or two six. Or, two or three. Two what or, was it only three? Yeah, we had two or three people um, uh, actually read excerpts out loud from the book. And uh, you know F words, and you saw all this stuff. And um, you know when you read a book, the, to hear those <laughs> excerpts read out loud in a formal setting of a board meeting was far worse. I felt very uncomfortable. It's far worse than reading that stuff to yourself, to, you know, quietly to yourself. Uh, the board members were very uncomfortable. Um, you know, they allowed it to continue, but it was a really uncomfortable yeah, we were, situation. Ronnie was hoping they'd stop it and say that's inappropriate in a yeah. meeting. Kind of like, <laughs> kinda like, kinda like yeah. Simon said earlier, right. like, I was hoping they were going to take him out with the police, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, um, two things. I think you said in the beginning, Southern Lehigh also yes. has this on their curriculum. Southern, the, the status at Southern Lehigh is the superintendent is currently reviewing my request right now as we speak. And I'm waiting for her to say, yes, we're going to keep it, or no, we're going to remove it. If she says no, we're going to we're going to keep it, then I'm going to go to the Southern Lehigh School Board next. Okay, because I I'm a Southern Lehigh. We have to talk then. Can we please talk after this? Because secondly, um, yes. would it have been more effective and more expeditious to do what you did, go right to the school board and read, have two or three, you know, taxpayers that were against us read this stuff? Because they're ultimately, as you said, the ones responsible, rather than the superintendent who apparently approved it five uh, years ago, saying, no, it's no good now. Yeah, how about two years ago, What's, you just did, did what you did? Yeah, in hindsight, um, I, I, I made a conscious decision not to read excerpts aloud at the board meeting because uh, I didn't feel comfortable doing it. Right. And in hindsight... Well, the kids are to read it. Exactly. And I just didn't feel comfortable personally. But in hindsight, that was obviously effective because that led to the meeting, which led to the vote. Um, but to your point, though, another issue is school boards will not listen to anything unless you go through the chain of command, right? You have to go through the principal, then the committee, and the superintendent. You have to follow the, uh, the chain of command before a school board will listen to anything. No, at, at a school board meeting, it's always open to the public. The public can come down and, and Yeah, check and then the first question is, did you contact the principal? That's what they'll say. And you'll say, uh, uh, no. Well, that's what I've seen happen. Can anyone support or... Or say that's not the case. People that are on boards. Yes, sir. Does that ever remember anybody, board member, superintendent, or the public, saying anything bad about whatever part of the curriculum? Well, they don't talk about the curriculum in general. Period. <laughs> that's one problem. Is that, your, is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. Curriculum is rarely discussed, mm -hmm. even though it's the product of the whole public school system. And it, it's it's very divisive. When you start bringing it up, but trust me, I've been on the on yeah. the receiving end, and they they come at you big time. You're not an expert. What do you yes. know about public education? We hired a superintendent and a principal and all these people. They're the professionals and you're questioning them as a school, and I'm a school board member. And, right. and it's like, you And know. as a school board director, the answer to that is, yes, you're right, but I am responsible for the curriculum as a school director. And therefore, I, I need to know what is going on. I need to weigh in. Yeah. Yes, sir. That kind of wraps it up in that you should be able to go to the board without going to the chain of command if we have responsible and, and community give members of the, of the community as school board members. By the time you the reality the, of the situation is based on what you said. Because we have teacher union hacks and people associated with the educational establishment, 
in those positions, that's the response that they're going to give you. Right. Thus, if we can reform the school boards and get responsible members of the community on them, then you would not have to go through that two-year circus to get this kind of Yeah, response. so that kind of damage is done. Yeah, this is two years now. Uh, let me go to Randy real quick. Yeah, real quick, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Mary School District, up until this last board was elected just this past year, they wouldn't even answer any questions. Right. right. They, they just they say no. They ignore you. They had no responsibility whatsoever to the public, and it was a real hassle. Like yep. Jim was saying about some of the things we tried to do, and it, it was a joke. Right. And I, I think, think that's more commonly the case. I want to say publicly that I think the system is almost broke. Right. There's, there's no way to really address the problem to the school board because they dance around and say, well, we can't discuss it. We got sunshine laws and we got this, and I'm not supposed to. <coughs> Up until this last time, the lawyer deliberately told the school board members there in front of us they didn't have to answer us. Yeah. Right. All right, so, okay, let me take one more question, and then, then we'll save the rest of the questions for the end. We have okay on time? We're, we're good. Okay, yes, sir. I just want to say the fact is that the superintendent is hired. School board directors are elected. Exactly. And the school board is representing the interests of the community. Right. The, commu the school district exists for the benefit of the community, not the other way around. I just want to say one really quick thing. There's a school board member here that was told by the president that she had no right to question the superintendent for budget figures. Right. <laughs> that's yes. got to be stopped. Right, and that's what the uh, that's what the Pennsylvania School Board Coalition is primarily for. All right, so I just have a couple of quick myths here, and then we'll get to some more comments at the end. Um, there's a myth that the person that submits a complaint, we talked about this earlier. Uh, well, you can't complain about the curriculum unless you're a parent or at least a resident of the school district. Just for the record, I am not a parent of any student in the Easton School District. I do not even live in the Easton School District. When I submitted my request per policy 109, I had to put my address on there, which I did. They were fully aware of the fact that I did not live in the, in the, in the district. They went and processed my complaint anyway. They did that because they have to. This, the Easton School District get, gets 30% of their funding from the state of Pennsylvania. We're all in this together sort of thing, and that's why they had to honor my request. Now, they often criticize, every board meeting I go to, the first thing they want to say is, Eric, Mr. Adams, where do you live? You know, they want to make a big deal out of the fact that I don't live in the, re in the school district. But that didn't stop them from forming this committee and spending tax dollars. All right. uh, we talked about this. this. It goes teachers, principals, superintendents, school board, community. Okay? So community is at the top. It's not at the bottom. Okay? And the school board is above the superintendent. Okay? Um, so let me get back to book burning real quick. Um, what happens is uh, I've been called a book burner. I even got to be called a Nazi book burner one time. And that's what you'll be called if you question the curriculum. You'll be called a book burner or maybe a Nazi book burner. And I want to tell you why you're not a book burner, okay? Here's why you're not a book burner. Okay, book burning historically is a tool used by both religious and secular authorities to suppress dissenting or heretical views that are perceived as posing a threat to the prevailing order. Okay, that's what book burning is. And book burning always results in the destruction of cultural and intellectual heritage. Okay, so book burning is a bad thing. Nobody wants to be a book burner. All right. However, the prevailing order in our public schools is not always the prevailing order of the general community. Okay, we're back to this disconnection. Okay, so like for example, mainstream ideas of God, country, and free market capitalism are often deemed heretical by our public school authorities. Okay, that's what we're worried about. Here. All right. So this is the process. This is the process for a citizen to get a book removed. Okay. What is, what's the process for a school district to remove a book? And we talked about weeding earlier. Okay? Turns out the process is the librarian comes across a book that they don't like. Oh, this book is about, this talks about um, free market capitalism. No, I don't like that. It's, they're going to say it's outdated, right? Okay? So they're, they're going to say, oh, I'm going to rip that weed out. And they're going to toss it out. Okay? Goodbye. And that's it. There's no steps. They don't have to get the superintendent's approval. They don't have to get the school board's approval. School board doesn't even know about it, okay? And just like that, possibly cultural and intellectual heritage is destroyed, okay? So, so here's my point. Keep in mind, I said earlier that the number of school, the number of books in a curriculum are very limited because there's only so much time in a day, right? So there's a limited number of books. 
At some point, a couple of years ago, somebody added nickel and dimed to the curriculum, right? So when they added nickel and dimed to the limited curriculum, something had to be removed to make room for it, okay? It's not the free market where there's always room for another book, okay? So the question is, what did they remove when they, to make room for nickel and dimed? And the answer is, we don't know what they removed, okay? But there's a possibility that they removed some of our cultural and intellectual <laughs> heritage. There's a possibility that the librarian burned a book that, 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 you know, that we valued as a community. Mm -hmm. So my advice to school directors, and this would probably be really novel, we'll start with Brian, okay? <laughs> school directors ought to, ought to ask their superintendents, please show me a list of all of the resource materials that were removed by your administration last year. I would like to see what, that, what those books were. And then decide, you know, on behalf of your constituents, did we throw away anything that was valuable? Okay, that's, a, that's right. It's a novel idea. Great idea. All right. So, and that, that's what I'm saying right here. To prevent book burning, you should you should do this. All right. Um, I want to definitely talk to John because I need somebody to help me in Southern Lehigh, just in case the superintendent there decides that uh, she likes the book. Um, and I have one more quick. Um, I want to make a, a quick a Ludwig von Mises quote. Anybody know Ludwig von Mises? Okay, a couple people know about it. Now, I read recently, uh, I encourage you to, to Google Ludwig von Mises, but he basically said at one time, he says, real power, what he called ideological might, real power always lies in the support of public opinion. If public opinion were ever to turn on any regime or any school district, okay, uh, its days would be numbered. Okay, so if Let's not be afraid of school districts. If enough people come to Easton board meeting on May 22nd, and they show up and they say, you know, nickel and dime is not appropriate, it's substandard, it's blah, blah, blah. If enough people show up, uh, I can guarantee you the book will be removed from the curriculum. Well, that'll be a stunning event, because that'll set a precedent. That'll, that'll actually do two things. It'll set a precedent for, any other school, for all other school districts that the community can actually um, have some control over their, over their curriculum. It'll also send a message from that school board to their administration. It'll, the message will be, look, nickel and dime is, is sub, substandard. It's not the highest quality. We expect more from you. Please select better books next time. It'll be a very <coughs> positive message. Okay? That's what's going to happen. So I'm really encouraging folks to come out to the meeting on uh, May 22nd and speak your mind. Um, I think there's a good chance they will remove the book because they don't want to be on the, rec on the record of uh, supporting it. Uh, nickel and Dime is infamous for its reference to Jesus as a wine-guzzling vagrant, and school board members don't want that, uh, you know, tag to them for whatever reason. Uh, so anyway, it should, be, it, should be, it should be interesting. If anyone wants more, I, I just sort of skimmed the surface. If anybody would like more information on the movies or the book, just please, please send me an email, and uh, I'll follow back with you. Uh, let's do some questions and comments. We, get, we have time for that. Paul, go ahead. Um, is this woman who wrote this book wrote another book, I think it's called Bright or Shine, I forget. The next one in this series, okay. in, in which she totally ridicules the American sense of optimism. The okay. fact that we're optimism <laughs> makes us morally evil and we should totally destroy the American sense of optimism, of progress, looking forward, and whatever. So that's her next attack. Yeah, she's written about four or five books. Uh, let me go back to, to Barbara. Did anyone in Nazareth complain about this book? That's my alma mater, and I was thinking, how could that book be there? Yeah, Dr. Dr. Lesky in Nazareth uh, wrote a letter back to me saying that the book was reviewed, and there's there's no problem with this book. He, he actually gave me three reasons why this is a wonderful book, and that was the end of it. I actually contacted the school board in Nazareth, and I was thoroughly uh, ignored multiple times. So is that your next target? I was told that there's going to be a new superintendent in Nazareth starting in a couple of months, right? Yeah. And I'm going to give him a chance. To be honest with you, I don't really want, I don't, I really think it's better to get the superintendent to remove the book, right. frankly, because it'll happen without all of the publicity. I don't really want the publicity. It's better to have silent change on something like this. But right. if, that new, if that new superintendent doesn't remove the book, then I'm going to have to, you know, make a public issue out of it. Yeah, Wayne. Maybe you can comment on this. Um, a month or so back, I wanted to uh, illustrate to somebody you know, what the book was about. So I went yeah. online looking for comments, um, reviews of it. 99% <coughs> of the reviews, they glow, this lady is a saint. Uh, it was hogwash. I actually found one review where the guy attacked it 
and he took a totally different tack than the naughty words or the drug testing or the bashing at Christianity. He said her whole premise was fraudulent. She separated herself from her family and friends, went to a different city, oh, yeah. got a hotel room, refused to make friends, really. She uh, you know, got this job. Anybody in her situation would have looked for a roommate, would have done th things to better themselves. And his whole premise was that this is a fraudulent, she had this outcome right. in, in, in mind. Yes. And Oh yeah, that's the joke. This, and this, that's one of the things I think you know, could be brought up. Oh, right. This, this, book, this, this, book is an, this book is an experiment and it's a... Uh, it's, it's a uh, the determined outcome. Yeah, already. the predetermined outcome of the experiment. Oh, it's called it's fraud. It's fraud. fraud. It's fraud. Right. It's fraud. Exactly. Right, but just... Let me I didn't say, read the book, so I'm saying, can you confirm um, that? Yeah, that's exactly correct. Um, yeah. But I, I do challenge you to go... If you go to Amazon, you, you will not find all five stars. You're going to find the full spectrum of one to five stars. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's the whole. It's it's the whole spectrum. If you look on Amazon. Uh, also, let me say one thing. When I submitted this request in 2010, uh, the American Library Association uh, ranked Nickel and Dime among the top ten most challenged books in the country that year. Okay. So it's, I'm not the first person to challenge the book. And let me say one last thing. There's a, there's a, there's parents in New Hampshire, Bedford, New Hampshire. Uh, their kid came home with this book, and these parents were so outraged they removed the kid out of the public school system. Just pull them out. Then they went back to the school board and they got on TV and they and they read on the riot act and uh, and the school board uh, the school board yielded and the school board voted to remove the book. So there's been one school board in the United <coughs> States that actually voted and removed the book. I'm hoping Easton will be the second one. Um, yes, sir. Let me come, I'll come to you next. I just wondered how did you ever become aware of the book's existence in the first place? If you're not a resident of or have children in there. Yeah, what happens is uh, I knew about the book just because I, I follow stuff like this. Um, and somebody overheard a Easton High School student complaining about their job at McDonald's. And they mentioned nickel and dime. And that person, you know, told me about it. And, you know, so now it's like a rumor. So I, I couldn't believe they were using the book in the curriculum. So I, I, I did contact the uh, English department to confirm it. And then I went to the principal. Your recommendation that uh, perhaps uh, we could uh, approach our superintendent and ask him for a list of uh, books that have been thrown out? Or yes, not? I highly recommend that. Well, would you appreciate that by asking for a list of books that are currently being used? Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, you could do that, too. But uh, you know what would know be really interesting, though? I think, I think the public, I think the media would be really interested in uh, you know, a complaint that a book was being burned. Or, or, or removed by the by the administration because in other words I I received so much criticism over book burning that wouldn't it be interesting wouldn't it be interesting to see what would happen if the school district was accused of it you know that would get a lot of you know uh, let me to your side. Yeah, I'm just going to comment as far as like freedom of speech I mean you your whole thing of going to the board and presenting yourself is to appeal to the board right and you're allowed to do that at any time. That they have a meeting, yes. and if they, they they can't shut you down, basically. Right. You have the right to say and do whatever you want. Yeah. And, but they have the right to not do anything. They have the right to. But they do can't it. say that. Well, we discuss this and all. Well, I might not know that. Right. And I have the right to appeal my complete appeal for the whole time period. They yeah. Shut you down. There. I don't think they can legally do that. No, they can't stop me from talking. I could go to every board meeting and talk for five minutes, yeah. but. What, what's going to the only reason I think they're actually having a vote on May 22nd is because they read the papers. They saw that this was in the morning call. This was in every paper. This was, I mean, was, the coverage was unbelievable. And again, uh, power lies in the support of public opinion. So if my if my complaint was trivial, they could get away with ignoring me. They can't get away with it because it's resonating with the with the whole community. But I would say too, if you go to the board meeting and you, it's an issue, take a camera. Yeah. Because they're gonna they're gonna pass issues and say, well, you can't read it here. We're gonna take a vote and put it in the minutes, and it's not put in the minutes, and you have nothing to document it unless you got a witness. So make sure you take a camera. That's good advice. And you do have the right to take a copy of the Sunshine Act. They cannot refuse you, and if they do, put it in writing. Take it to the lawyer, and you won your case because they have to let you videotape. Actually, Easton videotapes uh, 
uh, Easton videotapes all of their meetings, um, and uh, they do it through a public um, video service. And um, one of our members, well, the, the meeting about nickel and dime where the excerpts were read, one of our members went onto that public video site and um, actually copied the part of interest and put a label on it, nickel and dime, <laughs> and stuck that on there. So now when anyone in the world goes to the Easton's uh, videos, they see that instantly, <laughs> okay, because they don't own that service. That's right. The other thing that I'm concerned, and I, I again, I, I keep saying this, that I'm, I haven't done the research yet. There's also something that I think we need to start looking at as in, informed members. There's things called databases. What happens is the school districts, most of the research departments say, you as a student, it's too dangerous for you to just go out on the internet and do research, open research. There's too much garbage out there. I agree with that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not questioning that. But what I did find is my son was working on a research project, and it was, it was a conservative uh, point of view. It was uh, the Kelo decision, uh, the Supreme Court Kelo decision. We, I, we, I spent hours with him trying to find the information on the database inside their fiefdom. Couldn't find it. Went out on the internet, went to Heritage Foundation, boom, 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 all sorts of articles, all sorts of information. But he had to go to the teacher and ask permission to use these sources. So this was a, an extra step that he had to take. I was waiting for the teacher to say no. The teacher said yes. But the concern is, how many kids are going to do that? The other thing is, those resource data the the uh, recognition the mer what's it called the the I call it the bibliography uh, the, the where MLI you work oh, cited. MLI works cited portion of the, the thing if you go on again he hates to even think about this but when you go on those canned websites databases you can just cut and paste that data that MLA information and it's you're done. You can't make a mistake because it's exactly in the stupid format where the commas in the right place. I mean, it's really dumb out here. Every everything has to be exactly right, or they take points off. Well, since he was using outside sources, he had to create all that data the way they wanted it, and he actually got points taken off because I think he missed some things that they didn't have because he had to go through all that and that the, the format of the website didn't give all that information that he was supposed to report and it, it's a real mess so this is something I and it's it's covered by the academia is controlling what's on those databases and I think there's some really strong we need to get some researchers to go into that and find out what that is because every school district's doing it the, Be the, the libraries, Bethlehem Area uh, Library does it. Um, I know our school district does it. They have these data. That's where they want the students to search. Right. Everything so. is censored in the school district. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Do we have class? Is there anything else? Okay. Why don't we take about a five-minute, ten-minute.